once we, as we are now, um, we've moved through Shakespeare or we've been exposed to Shakespeare, um, it's important, I think, just to kind of take one of those moments where you stop and look around and have a sense of how far you have progressed or how, how things have changed for you in terms of your study or your experience or your conception of English uh, in terms of this course. Okay, so if we kind of stop right now, uh, right around the turn of the 17th century, uh, which is where we're going to find John Donne and start talking about John Donne and wit and all of those things in a few moments, but if we just kind of stop and think about where we've come and how the English language has changed and developed and transformed in terms of its you know, social capacities and its um, national and international recognition and its uh, you know, the various kinds of literature and art that are now being composed in English. You'll see just this amazing kind of breathtaking story kind of um, all rolled out behind you. And I know it can be hard to maybe uh, absorb all of that because you've been hit so quickly with so many different major writers. But if you think back, you know, all the way back to uh, Cade Mon's hymn, or even you know, start moving up a little bit through the uh, Celtic writing, um, uh, the scholar and his cat, and those kinds of things. And we start thinking about the various forces that kind of bore on, influenced, changed, transformed the English language in those in those early centuries, in those kind of seventh, eighth, ninth uh, centuries. And now we're here again on the the the, the very beginning of the seventeenth. Um, it's often referred to as the long 17th century, uh, which we'll figure out why in a little bit, but right now anyway, and we understand that we have this language that is just fully um, realized in terms of a language that is part of commerce, is part of theology, is part of um, um, you know art, is part of literature, and has just found so many different um, avenues for expression, and I, you know, it's obviously not the same language. I think that's really important to point out as well. The changes have been so many and varied, and the absorption of other, you know, uh, phrases and words and concepts from other languages in Europe has also been significant. So it's not like we're going to look at John Donne uh, or William Shakespeare and say we have anything remotely like uh, what the original, if there was an actual Cade Mon, uh, what uh, that person would have sounded like in his or her speech, and you're certainly seeing the difference even with people closer, like Mallory and Spencer, who are using these archaic phrases. Uh, maybe Spencer's the, the appropriate example there, but anyway, um, and earlier, if you look at, you know, actual renditions of Chaucer that aren't translated for a modern audience, you have a sense that things have changed very, very quickly, uh, modified very, very quickly, um, relatively speaking. Or maybe significantly is the right right word there. Anyway, so today we're here with, with John Donne, and so we, we're in a brand new landscape, and things are going to look different on this side of the of the mountain. Okay, we've kind of come up to the, the Shakespeare Peak, and now we're on another, another mountain or in another mountain range, and there's some different things for us to start to consider and think about, and frankly, things we really didn't have much of an opportunity to think about beforehand. Um, not that these um, aspects of English didn't exist, but we just didn't have them realized in the same way um, or uh, we haven't maybe recognized them as being as profound as they are in the writing of someone like John Donne. Now there's many ways, as you can tell from the Norton uh, description of Donne's life and Donne's interests and the many different kinds of writing he produced over the course of his life to come at this individual and it would be as ridiculous and reductive to do that um, you know, to try to talk about him broadly as it would be to try to talk about Shakespeare broadly or Spencer broadly or virtually any other writer we've read this semester broadly. But I think one of the things we really can have some fun with with Dunn is this concept of wit, this concept of being clever, this concept of saying, you know, clever things in an amusing way. Um, because we, we haven't encountered a great deal of wit, I would say, so far. There's certainly some in the sonnets, okay? Um, you know, um, there's various descriptions of, of lovers and interactions and there's some really surprising phrases there. Um, but we haven't, you know, if you look back at Spencer and I say, you know, is Spencer witty? You'd probably say maybe. Uh, he's certainly very clever and he's very imaginative, but is the cleverness itself you know, amusing or, or is he rendering things in, in amusing ways? And I think there are certainly you know, very fun kind of, you know, uh, reversals of fortune and um, interesting uh, personalities that emerge and surprising monsters and things like that. But I, you know, you'd be really hard pressed, I think, to look at the first um, or the first several um, 
portions of that document that we read and said, you know, Spencer was a real wit, and, and he would never have aspired to be, I don't think. We know that, and I'm a little bit of a, I'm a little bit of an aside here, but uh, Spencer, you know, is definitely writing primarily, was writing in the Romantic tradition, but he's also writing, um, as Benorton is suggesting to us, you know, in the shadow of Virgil and some of the Roman writers um, who don't have wit as a key feature of their um, poetry, but in Dunn and in a number of these other people we're going to be looking at, Johnson, and I wait till you get to Andrew Marvell, uh, to his coy mistress, and uh, is probably um, one of the wittiest poems I've ever read. I think you'll I think you'll enjoy it. It's a really standout moment. Uh, you'll see when we get there. But anyway, right now with Dunn, um, and I have in mind right now the flea, um, we have this really different, interesting kind of voice emerging. And so when you read the flea, which is the very first poem that's available to you um, from Dunn's Songs and Sonnets, you have this moment where you have this male, presumably male speaker, that is an assumption on my part, but traditionally this is read as a male speaker, um, trying to convince a woman essentially to sleep with him, okay, to use a euphemism. I guess that Dunn would also be uh, 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 fine appropriate. Um, but we have this example of a flea, and one man is trying to convince a woman to have sex with him, and his argument is, you know, there's nothing sinful about our uh, blood being mingled in this flea, so if that's the case, that bites me and then bites you, and our blood becomes mingled in the flea, so if that's the case, then how can there be anything wrong with us having sex with each other? Which, obviously, the answer is there's all kinds of things under the social conditions that are being addressed here, right? Um, but maybe not from the perspective of the speaker who's trying to convince uh, a woman. Uh, and, and generally, we can imagine many of these speakers being male speakers speaking to women, and that goes back to the history of the sonnet. Um, which you're seeing, of course, um, represented, although arguably with some really interesting changes um, in Shakespeare. So I don't want to, I don't want to indicate that all the speakers in um, in Shakespeare's sonnets are male. I, I think that would be a great disservice to Shakespeare. Um, but in terms of Dunn and a number of others, I think it's it's pretty safe to assume the speaker's male. You'll see this as well, certainly with Andrew Marvell. But this idea that um, there's a male speaker who's trying to say something clever and witty for a particular reason, and that is to convince a woman to have sex with him. And we will see this um, in a number of formats and in a number of different poems. Certainly, Dunn has a wide-ranging interest as well, so it's not all it's not all that, um, as you can pick up from this idea that he wrote all of these sermons and other things as well later in life. But he has this really, I would say, great period where he's writing these really kind of sharp, edgy, thoughtful, uh, punchy poems. And The Flea, I think, is a great example of that. If, if we look back, if we kind of turn around and look back at where we've come from, um, there is wit in Ch Chaucer, certainly. Um, I should have addressed that earlier. Um, Chaucer is hilarious in how he phrases many things. He's also devastating in how he phrases everything, but what, many things. But when you look back at the vast number, of, like Thomas of England is not witty, okay? <laughs> He's probably many things. He's not witty. Um, you know, Geoffrey of Monmouth, not that witty. Um, uh, is Marie de France witty? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure what to make of her, particularly because, well, for a couple of reasons, but primarily because Marie de France presents the information to us as if she has gotten it from some other source. She's kind of, you know, transcribing oral tradition um, into this uh, into this this prose uh, format. Um, is she interjecting her own wit in there? There's certainly probably examples of wit, and again, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but when we get to this kind of post-Elizabeth, um, by which I mean Queen Elizabeth, post-Elizabeth kind of court system, this vast social uh, entity with strong political associations and economic associations for the people who are associated, sorry to reuse the word there, but connected with the right power structures uh, in British society, one of the things we see is this explosion of wit, all of these really interesting uh, poems, sonnets that begin to appear as a kind of game. Uh, and the game essentially uh, is male speakers trying to convince or one-up each other with the wittiness of their appeals to various women in the court or perhaps outside the court as well, depending upon the poet. This is very similar to uh, contemporary American music culture, particularly uh, in the 80s and the 90s and the 70s, uh, what would be identified as rap culture by your Norton anthology in a very stodgy way. And I'll, I'll save you that designation, but this idea that there are male speakers who are trying to communicate um, with an idealized woman generally. Sometimes there's a real woman on the other end of the poem, but most of the time it's just an imagined scenario or an imagined woman, and trying to do so in a way that um, everybody can 
mostly male speakers anyway, would take some humor in uh, the, the the thoughtfulness of the uh, of the, the the courtly statements. Okay, um, if we look at the flea and we say this is a poem about courtship, um, then that might change your views on courtship if you see courtship as this very formal, intensely stuffy affair from the British Empire or in some other society. Anyway, when we get to Dunn, we have this, this emergence of wit. And certainly he's not the wittiest writer you're going to read. Um, and there's a lot of other really important concepts here, but wit is central to this experience. So I'm just highlighting that for you um, as one potential door into the really interesting mind of John Dunn. I think also at the same time, I need to be really careful not to indicate or to convey to you the idea that we somehow have witty people because we have a stable social structure for these people. And it's only after we get through all of the, um, you know, the wars and the, and the conflict and the, uh, and the centuries of struggle that we arrive kind of graciously at this stage of wit. I think that would really undersell what wit is and how primary wit is to the human experience. Um, just because we're seeing it in poems now doesn't mean that you don't have thinkers, people, citizens, kings, peasants, poets, songwriters before who are, you know, perhaps uh, just as witty, perhaps just as funny. We just don't have uh, the same kind of record, of, the same kind of documentation that very luckily we have with John Donne. And in John Donne, again, we have this fantastically prolific writer um, who lives an incredibly interesting life in terms of all the major political changes that are going on in uh, England um, over the course of his life. So we have literally somebody who starts out as a Roman Catholic from a Roman Catholic family, uh, going through all the social, um, you know, marginalization and alienation that comes with that when you're living through and post the Elizabethan uh, period and into James's reign, uh, obviously as well. Um, and then later in life converts um, to um, you know the Church of James and others, you know, the Church of James, what we'll call it right now, and then lives out the rest of his life, um, you know, following the dictates of that organization um, to survive. Uh, to have money, to have opportunity, to be able to make the kind of life that he would like to have, but he obviously can't have the one that he wants. And this, I think, is really important as well, because wit, I think, emerges um, not because people are fat and happy and safe in society. Wit emerges from struggle. Cleverness emerges from struggle. And this is a literary theme that is as old as the Odyssey, if you know the Odyssey. Sometimes I like to talk about the Iliad and the Odyssey, and I've, I've referenced them generally in this course, but if you go back and read the Odyssey, which I would strongly, strongly, strongly recommend every English major do, uh, you'll encounter the character of Odysseus. And Odysseus is Odysseus because he is clever, because he is wily, because he is wise. And why is he all these things? Because he's continually put in these really challenging dangerous situations that there doesn't seem to be any way out of except through wit, except through um, the clever, um, the clever, uh, resourceful uh, thought, statement, action that puts him ahead of his peers. So in Dunn, we have a true wit. Um, we have an interesting wit, uh, but it's not all we have again. So I'm, I'm repeating some of these basic points here. And I think it's interesting because one of the ways Shakespeare is interesting, going back to Shakespeare for a second, is that Shakespeare, um, you know, and again, I don't want to make him sound supernatural or anything, but Shakespeare, you know, we read him one way when we read him because of where we are and what we're interested in and what we've been focused on. So when you read him first in this course, I'm sure you brought to that reading um, all of the themes and concepts that we have been, um, you know, uh, discussing, developing, working with here over the past several weeks together. Shakespeare, you can also do this trick with, which is that you can now that you've read Dunn and you've thought a little bit more about wit, if you go back and look at his sonnets, you'll find some really interesting uh, witty phrases, um, uh, witty sayings, witty, witty observations that maybe passed you by the first time or might simply have struck you as confusing or nonsensical or I don't quite understand what he's doing here. Um, he's trying to present some old set images. He's trying to take some old worn out metaphors and present them in a new way that's interesting, exciting, perhaps upsetting, um, as the flea could certainly be uh, to you. Um, so I would just want to kind of have you think about John Donne in that context. Uh, he's a good writer to know because he writes so broadly. 
He lives so intensely and he gives us so many wonderful images, observations, and assertions um, that say a lot of great things, but I think what they really show us is that we are in a brand new landscape at this point in the course in terms of our basic conception of what the English language is. Okay, so I want to talk about that and it's going to help set us up for where we're going in the future. I also want to take some time today though to come back to this issue I wanted to address in the Shakespeare video but couldn't because I was I was running out of wind literally and I want to talk a little bit about a, a separate issue but a significant issue. Okay, and the separate but significant issue relates to Shakespeare and it relates to Shakespeare's status in contemporary American culture, many contemporary cultures, but I think American contemporary culture is one of the places where it's most problematic. One of the, one of the great challenges with Shakespeare in the contemporary world, if you're a contemporary reader, is that for so many people, um, there's a real travesty that's perpetuated against them, usually unintentionally, but nevertheless has devastating effects in terms of Shakespeare. Okay, and I want to just kind of draw your attention to this. So, uh, what happens very frequently to American students is that they are presented with Shakespeare as if he is somehow the pinnacle and all possibility of culture and you know high class status and insight and you know cultured people know Shakespeare. People who aren't cultured do not know Shakespeare, and so we try to edify everybody by giving them some exposure to Shakespeare. And if they fail in that endeavor, then there's something wrong with them. And that's the worst possible thing you can do to a student, or one of, the, one of the most disgusting misuses of Shakespeare that you could possibly do to a student is to say something like, memorize this, and if they fail to memorize it, you know, you mark them down, or if you say, what is this sonnet about, and they don't know, you, you, you just rip them apart. It's, it's, it's a useless thing to do. And it undermines Shakespeare because, and here's the kicker, the whole reason why Shakespeare is good to know is because Shakespeare is, well, not the whole reason, but a significant reason why you want to know Shakespeare is because in Shakespeare we can see, okay, we can hear the notes of the development of English. Um, not the entire story, but we can certainly hear uh, the notes, the major developments, the major changes, the difference, uh, the differences in focus that have come up across the centuries, the different, uh, you, know, you know, social um, concerns, the different political realities that have been so significant to the people who have kind of carried the English language as it has developed and changed and transformed and modified over time. We can, we can hear a lot of those echoes, and that's the key concept, echoes in Shakespeare. All of which is to say, if you come to Shakespeare and you have no context for the language, it's hollow. It's frustrating. Um, you're confounded by it. Everyone tells you that this is a great thing and you can't figure it out. And so you think, well, I'm stupid or Shakespeare's worthless, both of which are almost certainly not true. But if you come to Shakespeare with the context of the language and the context of its developments, and the potential aims of his efforts, he explodes into something that I think is very, very um, fascinating and meaningful and useful because we can see kind of represented in the writing of this one individual so many of not just the major concerns, but also his ability to kind of to kind of rephrase, repackage, represent, advance, modify, challenge many of these um, fundamental concepts that have been significant to the development of the English language. And in that, in, that, in that scenario, he's the exact opposite of someone or something that's hollow. He's this wonderful record, this wonderful statement of what has been possible with English, and in some sense, what, what, what could be possible with English. Um, and one of these things is wit, um, which is part of what's going on in his writing, but then we have these writers like Dunn and Johnson and Marvell later, certainly, who start to kind of tease out these strains and start to be inspired by what they read and start to carry these concerns in new and very different directions. So Shakespeare is not a be all and an end all. He's a statement of relevance for the English language. And that's a good place to begin with him. Um, but the worst place to begin with him is to begin with him. You need to have the context for why he's interesting um, before you encounter him or else you're just, you know, bowing down to someone else who tells you, well, this writer's great, so you should think that he's great. You don't need to think that he's great. You don't need to think that any of these writers are great, but you need to try to understand what they're doing. And once that starts to happen, I would argue it's really difficult to think they're not great. 
Um, but, um, you know, if you don't have that context, which you now have, if you've been doing the work in this course, uh, hopefully they're coming across to you in these new and interesting and more, um, uh, more, uh, fascinating ways than they otherwise would. So, um, a lot there on John Donne, a few moments there on Shakespeare that I couldn't, uh, shoehorn into my earlier lecture, but now I've, I've said them, so I feel like I'm square with the universe, uh, and with you. So I hope you, um, have enjoyed the reading with Dunn, um, and, uh, Looking forward to seeing what you produce. Have a great day.